Now this might be a stretch, but I want you to think back to the last time you were struggling and someone checked in with you. Perhaps you were drowning in deadlines. Maybe a loved one let you down. Or hey, maybe you were grappling with the fact that we are still living in a once in a century pandemic. At the time, you were feeling down and someone asked, how are you? What do you need? Or maybe they just acknowledged that you were going through a tough time. Regardless of in what capacity, if you've experienced a check-in, it's difficult to deny the magnitude of being heard, empowered, prioritized when you are vulnerable. Not only can it relieve the stress of that moment, but it can also prevent future emergencies from arising. This proactive approach in a crisis, while profound, is by no means always celebrated. We say heroes, and the image of someone just checking in, not the first thing that comes to mind. We say heroes, and we picture paramedics raising patients to the hospital, firefighters boldly fighting flames, or maybe even superhuman web shooters saving the day. Front row just flinched a little bit, like relax, you guys. Web shooters, not in the budget, I promise. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, we need these types of heroes. But the reality is, preventing a crisis is just as heroic as responding to one. And this rings especially true amidst the crisis we're living through right now, the pandemic. While many of us know the value of checking in personally, it seems to be missing from our public health response. Discussions around coronavirus infections are quick to blame the body. We trace a rise in COVID-19 hospitalization rates to pre-existing conditions, lack of herd immunity. And of course, there's truth to that. But the reality is rarely do we consider how disease is not just a result of the breakdown in the body, but a symptom of a breakdown in society a failure to check in within our own neighborhoods. Because as it turns out, prioritizing the needs of those most vulnerable can make the difference between responding to a crisis and preventing one. I lived and breathed the truth of that statement while serving in a rather unconventional role during the pandemic. Not as a healthcare worker, not as a health official, but as a resident advisor attempting to live and work in an undergraduate dormitory back in Michigan. This was circa 2020, which might as well be 20 years ago, given it was a COVID years. Now, I was, now as an RA, or resident advisor, we're permitted to move into the dorms a week before all other students. Now, I know many of you here have experienced the move-in firsthand, but even if you haven't, it's not hard to picture what it would look like in an ER waiting room and a Black Friday sale had a baby. It's chaotic, to say the least. Every year, the burden of distributing thousands of dormitory keys amidst this crowded chaos largely falls on student staff. And as staff, we knew that our risk of contracting COVID-19 would be especially elevated. Rather than giving those most vulnerable a seat at the table, when movement policies were being made, the university opted to implement what sounded like a good idea on paper. They'd limit the number of students who could move in every hour, the same number of students for every dorm, regardless if the dorm had a lobby the size of a living room or the basketball court. Now, clearly this one size fits all approach to public health wasn't gonna work without student staff present to articulate the exact differences and unique needs of each community. It's not surprising this approach made social distancing impossible. Unfortunately, this trend continued. Now the thing to note about a college dormitory or really any community for that matter, is that one's health is immensely connected to the health and well-being of everyone around you. If one student started coughing or sneezing in the dorms. It really wasn't long before the entire hall became a sniffling symphony. Between exchanging dormitory keys and handing over packages, manning the front desk, there was no doubt that student staff 
would be the most at risk of becoming COVID-19 super spreaders. We needed the university to prioritize weekly testing for all staff. However, when testing policies were being made, the university opted to randomize testing amongst the student body. Once again, those most vulnerable were kept out of public health decision making. Now I know what you're probably thinking. So Neda, if you didn't like your job, quit. I hear you. You're right. I chose to be an RA. But what is true for me and so many other workers during the pandemic is that my job had become less and less of a choice and more of a means of survival. My family lost their home, their income, my ability to keep a roof over my head, food in my fridge, and support my loved ones was directly tied to my position. Leaving a job is not much of an option when you have no home to return to. So I stayed. And it wasn't long before students' absence at the decision-making table began to show up in the campus COVID count. Coronavirus spread like wildfire. And it became clear that the university administrators had no intention of offering us a seat at the table. If we were going to protect the health of our communities, we were going to have to build that seat ourselves. Now, at the time, we didn't have big budgets, no public platform. As a pre-med student, community organizing was far from anything I'd ever seen on organic chemistry. Syllabus. As much as I wanted them to, acid-based reactions were not going to save me now. What we needed to do was generate public pressure. Nevertheless, despite our inexperience, peer by peer, speech by speech, media interview by media interview, we built a grassroots movement called Rest That Free Pool. There's me. It began with a petition outlining our concerns. This evolved into a campus march, socially distant, of course. This grew into a student strike, too bold for NPR to ignore. Soon, university staff across the country began to reach out because they were facing similar challenges. They used our movement as a model. We became a catalyst for putting public health decision-making back into the hands of those most vulnerable. And it was at this time that the pressure we had generated had become too much for the university to ignore. Finally, administrators responded by increasing our access to PPE, guaranteeing weekly COVID testing, and also ensuring weekly meetings between administrators and frontline staff. Finally, we had our seat at the table. It was at this time that I couldn't help but notice how quick the community, the surrounding neighborhoods were to mobilize around student staff. It became clear that they understood that if people in their own backyard were vulnerable, soon their health would be too. As grateful as I was to be immersed in this movement, I felt isolated by my own inquiry where was this same energy, same enthusiasm for addressing health inequities, a public health crisis that didn't always make the news? Just like a viral outbreak, health inequities function as an unseen enemy, disproportionately impacting Black, Hispanic, low-income communities. Just like a viral outbreak, you can see the toll of health inequities on a map. Not, in, not just in distribution of COVID cases, but as in a wide range in average life expectancy. Within Michigan neighborhoods alone, there is a 29-year difference between the average life expectancy of someone born in East Grand Rapids versus some neighborhoods in Detroit. Inequity like this exists throughout the country. How is this any less of a crisis too? Similar to a viral outbreak, 
health inequity remains a threat to all. Not only does it exhaust local healthcare resources, but it also makes us more vulnerable to pathogens, whether it's during a pandemic or the annual flu. No, health inequity doesn't spread person to person, per se, but it does spread from generation to generation. Health inequity is infectious. And unless we protect those most vulnerable to it, unless we empower them, we jeopardize the well-being of the entire community. By all means, my experience is not the only proof of this. A community in Albuquerque, New Mexico, realized this truth when they organized around food insecurity and nutrition through the Southwest Organizing Project. This initiative was born from 13 ordinary citizens who recognized that Albuquerque's Hispanic youth were disproportionately impacted by the lack of produce available in their neighborhoods. By listening and learning and offering a seat at the table to their Hispanic neighbors, they organized gardening workshops that increased access to fresh produce for the entire community. By offering a an equal seat at a decision-making table alongside city and health officials, together they targeted inequity and everyone's health benefited. Now I know it might be tempting to believe that this pandemic has created new problems, new gaps in our health system, but the truth is the public has been missing from our public health response long before COVID-19. Amidst any crisis, if decision makers are not listening, are not empowering, are not uplifting those most vulnerable, they jeopardize the well-being of the entire community. It is up to all of us to lean on our tools of civil disobedience, to ensure the right voices are heard. It just so happens the campus we're sitting on right now is perfectly poised to put the public back in public health. Our very own Rhode Island State Department has created what is known, or Health Department, has created what is known as health equity zones. These are designated committees where community members like yourself can sit alongside nonprofits, city and health officials, all working to assess and address the needs of their community. Everyone here right now can join a health equity zone and work alongside these organizations the moment I stop talking. Regardless of where you are watching this, the key is to not wait for a crisis, to get to know the needs of your community. I know when we think of heroes, we often think of the person that responds to an emergency. They're the doctor running a code blue. They're the firefighter boldly fighting flames. But the truth is, heroes are also the people that prevent a crisis. The heroes that we need right now are the ones that understand part of being healthy means checking in with the needs of your community. Disease may be a complication of society, but the treatment is simple. It's our action. Let's get to work.